Uh, we're just going to move on to our last talk of the day, uh, which is from Chris uh, Banger from uh, Sheffield University, who is going to be talking to us about the Internet of Things. So there's another engineering talk, but there's apparently going to be quite a lot of crossover to, to what we're doing. So, Chris, whenever you're ready. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, fingers crossed it will be. Um, uh, it's going to be going off on a bit of a tangent compared to what everyone else is doing. So uh, fingers crossed so I don't send you to sleep. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for letting me come along to this. Um, so my little talk today is going to be on IoT and um, cheap automation, effectively. So uh, it's going to be more of the nuts and bolts of how to do experiments uh, quickly and remotely. Um, so I'm a teaching technician in the fluids uh, laboratory in the Diamond at the University of Sheffield. Uh, it's an interesting uh, place. Uh, my, my friend Tom Howard gave a talk, I think, just before Christmas on uh, the specifics of how we operate. And I'll go into that in a, a little bit uh, after I've did the introduction and uh, a bit more on my background. So first off, this is what I'll be covering. So myself and MEE first, uh, I'll be going, seeing what the problems are with remote teaching. It's probably been covered here numerous times, so I won't go into too much depth. Um, we're looking at our solutions for uh, doing controls and experiments at distance, how we can democratize this using uh, very cheap icon controllers, and uh, a nice little example we've got um, with uh, DIY photobioreactors. So uh, this is kind of my pet thing in a lot of ways because my PhD was uh, green algae and things uh, using those many moons ago, but uh, I've still got a soft spot for little green fellas. So uh, I'll be going through that. And, and also how we can effectively add brains to existing dumb equipment uh, using this kind of IoT approach. Some of the benefits and issues we've discovered, uh, then I'll just go straight into the discussion. So uh, I'll be keeping it light. So um, multidisciplinary engineering education or MEE, uh, that's us in that nice shiny uh, diamond building you can see behind. Uh, we've got 19 specialist labs uh, on site. So we cover everything from the standard engineering fair, from mechanical engineers, civil engineering, thermo, but we also have got two specialist bio labs. We've got an analytics lab, um, also a place where we can do uh, semiconductor production, also pilot scale um, kind of chemical engineering. So we've, we've got our fingers in a lot of different pies. There's a lot of different crossover. So this is where a lot of this um, microcontroller stuff that we've been doing in our projects will come in uh, handy, hopefully to you guys on the biological front, but uh, if you can get something from that, it's great. We do mass teaching, uh, 5,000 plus students uh, doing all the different aspects. So um, we like to have things as uh, automated and as slick as we can just to deal with the sheer volume of students we've got going through the labs on a day to day. And uh, COVID has thrown a huge curveball with this in terms of how we've had to adapt to doing remote labs. So uh, this will be one particular facet of our uh, approach for uh, tackling this online learning. Uh, my own background, um, I, my undergrad was in uh, design engineering, then I did a PhD in, in energy engineering, which was half chemical engineering and half biological, looking at algal uh, biodiesel production uh, on the bioreactor side, hence my love of the photobioreactor uh, kind of project. My current role, um, I am kind of the chief bodger in our lab. I, uh, I like to put a lot of equipment together on the cheap um, and work with a lot of students in their own self builds and things, as well as designing um, a lot of equipment for teaching that the academics come with. So I'm kind of where the rubber hits the road for a lot of uh, the projects. But I also do face-to-face -face teaching alongside the academics as well as the builds. So it's kind of a unique role, quite fun. So, uh, Simulations, it's not real. There is no spoon, et cetera. That's now one's for you, David. Um, <laughs> yeah, there are, there are lots of ways we can tackle uh, remote learning. Uh, you can use stock data as being discussed, or you can reduce the interactions if you can get the students uh, into the labs with remote distancing. But that's very difficult and it can be uh, less than satisfactory for students uh, trying to get the best university of experience. 
And the other issue is if you give them stock data or if you've got limited interaction, you miss a lot of the complexity. Now, from my particular um, viewpoint in fluid dynamics, it tends to be a lot of the uh, phenomena we study are highly turbulent and transient. So it's very hard to simulate uh, that kind of end. But I know um, from bitter experience when you're trying to grow uh, bugs for certain um, projects and things, they never behave in a model kind of way. So uh, what we would like to do, what we've been trying to do in our lab is trying to get as close as we can to real life uh, situations by using control at a distance. Now, the, the low hanging fruit for us was in our lab was we had four computer controlled uh, wind tunnels that were on hand that typically we had uh, groups of four students each coming in and we had a booking system that myself and the academic Dr. Uh, Garrard developed that we had time slots, but due to COVID that went out the window. So we were thinking what's the next best thing? Fortunately, because the computer, um, these computers installed in the wind tunnels to control them anyway, it enabled us when coupling that with um, our IT uh, boffins to uh, create a remote access uh, system using RDP. So how that worked was um, we created Google kind of slots or um, time slots in our VLE, which is Blackboard. We produced a load of online training and how to uh, run the software, uh, videos, and there's also something else if I can just stop this share and share another part of my screen. One second. So I don't, don't know if this is popping up in your screen here. So we also created uh, photogrammetry uh, models of a lot of the um, the hardware we've got so the students could actually get the physical lay of the land, see what different parts of the equipment are so you could click on them, interact with them to a certain point and have hyperlinks embedded with the different kind of technical documents for the equipment. So these were also something we embedded into the VLE uh, to give the students um, more access. And the other part of it is uh, these 3D models we also developed into VR. So you, if, the, if the students themselves had uh, things like Oculus Rift headsets or, or whatever at home, uh, you can also use that outside of the browser and actually walk around the equipment and uh, you know get a more visceral sense of what you're actually doing, which I think a lot of the students responded to quite well. So back to my presentation. Okay, so that was a VLE. We also had hyperlinks going to this remote access RDP page. This was uh, set up so the students would only go in at certain time slots and not kick each other off. We also had an admin override uh, from the IT services. So if there's any issues, you'd get flanked up and the issues would be passed on to us. The technical staffs so would go in and have a look and see if the wind tunnels were down or if there was any problems to service them and made sure that all the students got uh, the teaching time available. And it worked just using the basic Windows uh, remote access. So eventually it just gave them access to the, uh, the Windows screen and the software and they could run whatever they wanted to do. The only downside to this approach was with the wind tunnels, uh, you couldn't physically manipulate the models that were in there. So um, one of the key experiments they do is with uh, wings and you, you set the angle of attack of the wing to make it stall at a certain degree. So the students would normally alternate it themselves and find that stall point. So what we did to get around that is we had the four wind tunnels, we set them up at different increments and they could log into each of the wind tunnels in series and perform an experiment, then compare the data afterwards using a model. That seemed to be quite successful for that. We also had some uh, symmetrical models in there so you didn't have to tilt them. So the only thing that was students would need to do normally would be to vary the fan speeds, which they could do remotely anyway. So that worked just as well as if they were there physically. And we had webcams set up on, uh, on the, the models as well, streaming live, so they could actually see um, the models moving around. We had bits of cotton and things, so they could, um, they could see the physical interactions with the models as if they were stood there. So it, it was a good uh, kind of 
plan B, uh, it adds a few teething problems, but the, the main issue is if a lot of universities or other uh, colleges, technical colleges and things wanted to uh, take this approach and run with it, it's very expensive if you've not got the infrastructure in place. So what we wanted to develop was something that was a bit more, well, as I say, democratized for all low cost. And this is where uh, microprocessor control systems uh, really come into their own. You've probably all heard of at least one type of these systems uh, in your uh, research. The, the BBC microbit control is immensely powerful. And for that price, I know you, you could barely get a pint in some countries. So uh, it's really incredibly cheap, powerful. And you can, as long as you've got the sensors that you can buy um, pretty cheaply from places like RS and Rapid, you can build a system very quickly to do all sorts of different experiments. The major learning curve with this, however, is learning the software. Now, I was not a controls engineer by trade, but during the first set of lockdown, uh, some of my colleagues gave me some documentation and I thought, well, I'll, I'll put myself in the shoes of um, the students and try and actually create some of this stuff. So here are three of the projects that I've been messing around with for the last uh, 12 months or so. The first one on the, the left is a, a Reynoldsometer. So uh, this incorporated uh, a very cheap uh, Amazon special three pound flow sensor, which is the one on the left there. It's a 15 pound temperature sensor, a 20 pound um, Arduino that uh, I got, and there's a, uh, an LCD and a few LEDs. So I think probably all in, you, you're talking less than 50 pounds for this thing. And if you look, look at the programming which you can get online, and there's loads of tutorials on the Hackable website and uh, a few others on uh, Adafruit, that's a good one to, uh, to memorize. In the space of a, a week almost, I, I built a system that could measure flow rates in real time, temperature compensate, and also give uh, an indication of what the flow uh, regime was, whether it was laminar, turbulent or transitional, and uh, produce a, a traffic light of colors. So effectively, he's recreating um, a simplified digital version of what Osborne Reynolds did in the 1800s, um, looking at flow um, turbulence for not much money at all. And you could apply this to any experiment if you were, you were pumping reactants and you wanted to measure the amounts going from A to B. You wanted to know how much shear stress uh, was working on the, uh, the bugs as you're mixing them in a bioreactor, et cetera. It is very simple, very low cost. And if, you, if you're willing to just put that tiny bit of effort up front, you can run all sorts of different experiments. So the second thing I did after that was uh, I got a, a fan that we had off the shelf in the lab, a bit of drain pipe, a 3D printed nozzle on the end, drilled a couple of holes, pressure transducer connected to the same equipment there. You've got something that you can measure like a miniature wind tunnel. So they could do different uh, things using pitot tubes. And the last one on the end is something I came up with, uh, which is a rheoscopic hydro tunnel. So it's like a liquid version of a, a wind tunnel there. Again, it's got a flow meter at one end. Uh, you can set up a camera or a webcam, which we, we, we uh, streamed live to a lecture theater. And we also had some of the data going over the internet using the IoT protocol uh, to show what was happening when I was twiddling uh, the, the flow controls at one side to all the students. So again, it was a proof of concept, but we, uh, again, very low cost, all built in house from sticky back plastic and good thoughts, and it worked. And the students were really uh, enjoying that. So the next thing we did is we wanted to take it to the next level and turn it into a student project. So, um, and one of my colleagues, Dr. Adam Funnel, uh, and the, the guys in the electronics workshop and the guys in the, the bio labs we had and myself, we all got together to form this kind of super project to design photobioreactors, which the students would be able to build during the course, uh, develop and test their own uh, assays for growing algae, looking at glycerol, cell, uh, cell disruption, chlorophyll counts, pH measurements, you name it. The way I designed this thing was um, to be kind of like a modular chassis with different kind of screw terminals on the top. Then you'd have an Arduino control system and the students would keep stage by stage adding different complexity to that and then be able to do different tests onto the bioreactor 
and this cascades through a week's um, through of sieging. Now that's something you could do on a local level, like I've mentioned on the previous slides there. So uh, you, you'd have the Arduino connected to a computer, but, if, but to take it to the next level, that's where the IoT uh, protocols come in. And if you get the right kind of microcontroller, such as the one we've got here, which is the Arduino ESP32, it incorporates Bluetooth technology as well as Wi-Fi. And that's where things get really interesting. So the students are able to design and build their own uh, experiments, but using something called the MQTT protocol, they can stream the data over the internet and perform experiments remotely. They can get it to do data logging autonomously using this protocol, and they can pretty much sign in from anywhere around the world as long as they've got access to the server. Um, the other guys in the electronics and control are the experts in this, so I won't be able to answer too many questions on this side of things. But um, again, the price wise, uh, this experiment, probably less than hundred pounds, you'd be able to build a Birect that would be able to be internet uh, kind of uh, transmissible. Uh, if you compare that to things like Applicon Birect or whatever, you're talking 20 grand or something. So if you've got the time and energy to be able to do this, once you've done it once, once you've built this network and library of protocols up, the experiments you can do are limitless. So the, ne the next project uh, that we're currently looking at is uh, in my lab. And if, just like the Tin Man, I'm trying to add a brain to a dumb thing. So we've got these hydraulic benches, which basically are glorified sinks um, with a pump attached and a manual control valve. So what we're planning to do is we'll be adding um, a control panel integrating that into the back of them there with one half of it will be designed to have the low cost um, Arduino based system with a bunch of sensors that are going to be built into it and I'll be broadcasting over the internet. The second half of it is a more industrial uh, related version of it running in parallel using a PC uh, and that's working on the national instruments uh, kind of framework. So this should hopefully allow us to automate uh, any of the labs we're running uh, normally for face-to-face -face teaching when the students aren't, aren't there. So uh, the capabilities will be enormous, but uh, it's, a, it's a heck of a project and I'm, uh, I'm up to my balls with it at the moment, but it's, it's been very rewarding so far. Uh, sadly, I think we're gonna be out of lockdown before it's finished, but there are a ton of benefits um, that it will have for teaching long term. So uh, due to the fact it's such a multidisciplinary thing, it should decrease siloing uh, between departments. We'll be able to get the controls engineers, the bioengineers, everyone in to do group projects on these kind of pieces of equipment. And I've also set it up so the control panel is safe to be opened up and it will have tinkering stations. So if they want to add a sensor, the students can go in and just literally plug it in do the experiment, see how it goes, stick a reactor module on top of it, pump some water through, you know, you name it, it's going to be a mo completely modular chassis. And that's the way we're going to uh, go for it. If we get it up and running, and the same for the bioreactors, it should increase utilization of our lab equipment as well. So um, we may be only around from nine to five. That, that doesn't mean that experiments can't be run overnight. So the students might be able to book sessions on, or we may be able to get the research people rather than undergrads in there to run their own experiments and utilize the equipment. And it's very flexible, so we can work around different uh, lecturing schedules and bookable time slots using the same ways we did for the wind tunnels there. So uh, downside, it is DIY, um, and there's a huge learning curve at the start, and there's a lack of manufacturer support, but I would say um, it's well worth the effort from what I've seen so far. That's pretty much the, the end of my, uh, my talk. Uh, if you want any additional information on uh, what we've been doing related to this in the Bioreactor, there is a, uh, a publication that we've got on, out there and I can connect you up with Dr. Funnel. And we've got information on the website here for practical uh, engineering education on our blog spot. That's it. Um, thank you very much for, for listening. Thanks, Chris. Engineers are quite clever folks, aren't they? Uh, they try. <laughs> they try. Like I say, I'm a bodger. I'm not. I'm not the expert. I just. Uh, I try my best to make things work. <laughs>
No, I think there's some fantastic opportunities there. Um, the one question I actually had for you is what software was used to, to create those sort of 3D rotational models? Do you know? Yeah, um, quite a few, actually. The, um, are you talking about the photo, uh, photogrammetry models? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, there's, there's um, a piece of software called, uh, I think it's one of Autodesk's um, bits of programs that you yeah. just bear with me one sec I'll just have a quick look I might have got it in here I'll just um, just stop sharing my screen for a second recap photo that's what it's called Autodesk recap photo however um, when I was creating those I was experimenting around and um, there is an open source um, version of this um, online I, th I, I can possibly send a link later on um, it is, it's one I found on YouTube where you can actually just download and as long as you've got an NVIDIA graphics card you can upload the photos or camera phone photos from all the different angles and it actually compiles it turns it into a 3D model the, the tricky part, though, is actually translating that into something that you can embed into your VLE. Uh, and I used Blender and a program called Blend for Web uh, to export that through to make it into that format. But, I mean, I could give another talk on that side of things because that was hugely convoluted, but it's uh, quite fun. You're sticking your hand up for more work here. Um, <laughs> David David's asked, uh, how much of these so how many, how much of these approaches will be you keeping going forward? So is this, this is something you're going to maintain post COVID or? I, I'm hoping so. Yeah, um, it, it, it depends how much time I can actually get from my day to day running of the lab and the the other uh, aspects of my job. Really, um, at, at the moment, the the build for the, the hydraulic bench, that all singing and all dancing. Uh, one, I'm kind of working full time, but soon as uh, the, the government's changed their mind recently on what's happening with teaching, it's kind of all hands to the pump at that side of things at the moment. So uh, it's on the back burner. I think your bo your boss has asked the question, which maybe we can open up to, uh, to sort of all the members here. Maybe put a yes or a no in the chat. If the students are accessing, controlling, and measuring real equipment from home, does this fall under the definition of dry science? So what do we think of it as a as a group? We put yes or no in the chat. Lots of yeses. That's We're getting lots of yeses. So the answer is that hundred percent. We will be moving towards remote access after COVID. Nine to five students in the lab. Nine five to nine where they can play while we're not there. That's brilliant. There we go. Good Andrew Hooker Commington is the, is the, uh, the academic in my lab, so he should know. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent. Uh, Chris, thank you very much for sharing that. I think it's it's really nice to have a, a break from the sort of like the more biosciences talks and to have something that's completely different, but where you can see applicability to what you're doing in terms of the algae growing. You could use that for bacterial culture, for example. I think that's brilliant. So uh, thank you very much for taking the time to, to come here today and to share that with us.